Welcome back to the second video in this series of recreating this amazing 1890s walking jacket. I covered in the last video the construction of the back of the jacket. This video covers the construction of the front of the jacket. Now a lot of the video is going to be about pad stitching it's a technique that I was taught at work, uh, both hand pad stitching and machine pad stitching. Um, I don't have a machine to do pad stitching for me, so I'm doing it all by hand. So without any more faffing around, let's go. My first job is to pin my pattern piece onto my horsehair canvas. I've pre-shrunk my horsehair canvas because I don't want the canvas to shrink either during construction or during wear. Once horsehair canvas is shrunk, you have no hope of getting it back to the original size and potentially the original shape. So. Uh, it's standard operating procedure to pre-shrink your, your canvas. You can do this by soaking it in water, wringing it out, pressing it then with a very, very hot iron until absolutely all of the moisture is gone from the fibres. You can also see that I have altered the jacket front from the original pattern. This is because I don't want the canvas to run all the way down to the hem other than at the very centre front because I wanted to maintain its shape. So I have cut out both of the darts and the section from between the two darts and then from the outer dart to the side seam I have all cut off at the waist. I've also cut out a section along the side seam to allow for greater flexibility in shaping the garment. So with my pattern pieces cut out, I've moved to basting them into the jacket front. You can see that I've pushed the canvas underneath the darts and I'm just basting that in place along the dart and I, I will baste all the way around the whole of the canvas. I've done this in a pink thread so that when I remove my basting stitches I know which stitches I'm removing because I will be doing the pad stitching in white cotton thread. Now it might seem quite unnecessary to baste the canvas into the jacket knowing that you're going to be pad stitching it in but pad stitching around pins can be quite difficult. The thread gets caught quite a lot so it's easier and in the long term it's, it's quicker to baste the canvas into place. It also means that you don't stab yourself in the finger unnecessarily with spare pins. And that's the canvas basted into both of my jacket fronts. So now I'm attaching some quarter inch cotton twill tape to the centre front of each jacket piece. I'm laying the tape on the very, very edge of the canvas so that when I whip stitch it in, the edge of the canvas sits just underneath the tape. This will make it easier to fold the seam allowance inside further on during construction. I'm laying the tape on relatively loosely. I know that the tape will shrink as I whip stitch it slightly. So to try and minimise the 
tightening up of the fabric, I'm keeping the tape quite loose. I'm just laying it very gently, very flat on top of the canvas. And I'm stretching the canvas very, very slightly as I pin it so that as it returns to shape, it gives me that little bit extra leeway in terms of the, the tape shrinking during the whip stitching process. So you can see as I man manipulate the fabric, the, the tape isn't stretching. There's no stretch in the tape at all, but it's not pulling anywhere. And I'm going to leave myself just a little bit of a tail at the end to make sure that I've got a little bit extra to play with in the event that it does shrink up further. And then I'll repeat the whole process on the other side. So now I'm just whip stitching my cotton tape to the canvas and cotton interlining. I'm trying to catch a very small amount of the wool underneath so that all three layers are stitched together but the stitching isn't visible on the outside of the lapel. I will whip stitch down both sides of the tape so that it's secure on both edges and I'll repeat that for the other jacket pattern piece. And then I'm just whip stitching the raw edges of the canvas down to the cotton interlining. Again, I'm just catching a very, very small amount of the wool at the same time so that all three layers are secured together. Just means that the canvas isn't likely to shift once I've got my lining in, because once I've got my lining in, I, I can't secure it. And I'm just tying off my end. I'll carry on whip stitching around the remaining raw edges. So this is a sample that I did. Unfortunately, the footage that I took of pad stitching the actual jacket turned out not very well. So I have done a small sample to talk you all through the process of actually pad stitching. So again, I've got my finger underneath where my work is going through. I can feel the needle, but I can't see it when I turn it over. The distinctive feature of pad stitching is the herringbone style. So you effectively do a long diagonal based. My pad stitching here is about half an inch long or just under. I wouldn't really recommend any larger than that. This is the absolute maximum. And again, you can see my fingers are underneath where my needle is going in and then coming through. I, so I can feel that I'm going through the canvas, through the cotton and catching a very small amount of the wool so that hopefully when I remove the pink basting stitches and cut off the edges of the 
cotton and the wool, which I wouldn't do on the actual jacket itself. You can see that all three layers are attached. The trick with pad stitching is to keep your stitches with a neutral tension. You don't want them too loose because you don't want the layers to shift, but equally you don't want them too tight because then on finer fabrics you will get something called pick up. Pick up is where you can see the puckering of stitches that have either gone too deep or you've pulled your thread too tight. On lighter weight fabric, a certain amount of pick up is inevitable. You, you can't really avoid it. But on a heavier fabric like this uh, coating weight Melton, you shouldn't really have pick up at all. You shouldn't be able to see any dimpling or puckering on the outside of your garment. Now I'm right handed, so I'm working from right to left. If you're left handed, you would be working from left to right. And the idea is that you work up and down your piece. So you work from right to left, going up, and then you move over and do the other side of your herringbone, working back down again from right to left. If you turn your work so that you're working always up or always down a piece of fabric, then you will lose that characteristic herringbone effect. So now, as I would if I was stitching an actual garment instead of a sample piece, I'm whip stitching the raw edges of the canvas in place. Horsehair canvas can be quite spiky and you don't really want the fibres working loose. So whip stitching helps stop that from happening or whip stitching the edges stops that from happening. Now I'm just taking out my basting stitches. So my basting's out, I've whip stitched all round, I've pad stitched the whole area. I just need to take off the stitching at the edge where I secured the cotton to the wool. I wouldn't do this if it was a project. I would leave those stitches in place and I wouldn't cut down my seam allowances. This is purely to show you that all three layers are now securely attached to each other. I'm just going to open it up and you'll see that there. They're all attached, all three layers are stitched together. The interlining just serves to keep the look of the jacket smooth. 
And as you can see, I've got no puckering, no dimpling. It's all just lovely and smooth and flat. Huzzah! So this was me working on the actual jacket. This was the tiny, tiny bit of footage that I had that I didn't manage to completely botch. But you will notice that at some point I must have forgotten what I was doing and I've turned my work because those two rows of stitches are both going the same way. They should be forming that characteristic herringbone B shape or W shape and they're not. They're both going the same way. I ended up unpicking this when I realised my mistake. So now my pad stitching is all done, I am basting down my seam allowances. I'm basting them down all the way to the hem, or where the hem will be. Pesky knots. Basting the seam allowance of the darts down allows me to whip stitch the tape more securely onto the dart. So I've got a half inch or so turnover at the end. That's to stop the bone when it goes in from working its way through. So it'll sit in like a, almost like a pocket. I'm just doing a couple of back tacks to secure the top edge of the boning channel tape. This is half inch cotton twill tape, so it's exactly the same as this, the tape that I used for covering the front edge of the centre front jacket. It's just half an inch wider, that's all. What I want to try and do is make sure that I keep the centre of my tape over the centre of the dart. And I know that my boning is 5mm and the centre part of the twill tape is also 5mm, which is handy. So I'm just using the change of direction on the twill tape to guide where my stitches go. At the top I've whip stitched into the canvas but once I've hit the dart itself I'm just whip stitching onto the dart I'm not taking it any further through and that will just keep the boning securely in, in the, inside the tape and it will stop it from working its way out I'm just checking every inch or so that I've still got my centre tape over the centre of the seam. That way my bone will stay relatively cent central to the dart. I'm just going to leave the bottom inch or so open so that I can actually get the bone in. I'll be using synthetic whale bone on this bodice. And then I'm just going to work my way back up to the top. Doing exactly the same thing. So I'm just catching the wool. It's like the top layer of the dart and securing the tape to that. 
and again using the change of direction to give me my 5 mil space inside. Then again, the trick is to have your stitches not too tight, but not too loose. The Goldilocks stitch. You want them tight enough so that they're secure and nothing's going to start shifting around. But you don't want them so tight that things start to pull. And then I'm just going to secure the top of the bowing channel to the canvas. And tie off my loose end. So now I'm ready to actually assemble the bodice, everything's pad stitched and my boning channels are in on the front, matching up my waist marker. So I've just put a pin in the top, I'll put a pin in the middle, and then I'll put a pin at the hem, and then I'll balance everything out. easing in any fullness. You can see that there's a little bit of fullness on one side of the fabric compared to the other. So just stretch it very, very slightly and ease that in. I'll put another two or three pins in between to make sure that it's just held in place while I'm stitching. in and then I'll do the same from the waist to the underarm ease in and balance out any fullness it's not that much on the waist underarm part of this seam time for trusty jack to do his thing so standard julie victorian seam allowance is half an inch so that's what i'm using half inch seam allowance and i'm just gripping both sides pull all of the fabric slightly taut. Now I take my pins out. I know a lot of people don't and I know they get a flack for it. But my machine was not cheap and I can't afford for it to be out of action. 
so I take my pins out. On a domestic, it doesn't really matter so much because the power of the, the motor isn't enough to make, normally, hitting a pin a major drama. Trusty Jack has a 400 and something watt engine compared to a 70 watt engine motor engine. <laughs> Goals as a 70 watt motor a domestic so he's, he's got quite a lot of power there and it's enough to make hitting a needle a major headache so I take my pins out so these are now my sleeve panels because both sides of the fabric the wall are identical it's almost impossible to tell them apart i've drawn a massive great big cross on the wrong side so i know which sides i'm doing this together now all i do is notch a cut put a little tiny little cut in um, i don't generally tend to use a notch marker which takes a chunk of fabric out just put a, a very little cut in and I do that for marking darts normally as well. So I've balanced my seam so I'm making sure that where the top panel crosses the bottom panel is level with the half inch seam allowance. That way when I turn it inside out I've got a nice smooth edge going around the top of my sleeve head joining one piece to the other. And you'll notice now that I'm not using any pins at all. This is a relatively straight seam, it's relatively easy to balance. I'm just keeping hold of where the notches are to make sure that the machine doesn't pull one side, one piece of fabric through faster than the other. And then I'll pause, balance the bottom where the cuff is, and carry on stitching. On long, relatively straight seams, it's much easier just to not bother pinning at all. It's faster. I'm very lazy. So lazy. And again, doing the same on the opposite side. So I'm balancing my seam allowances to make sure that my needle goes through. Gives me a nice smooth line around the sleeve head again. And then just off camera, because my camera won't zoom out for some odd reason. I sometimes work with one hand inside work because it means then that if, as the machine pulls the fabric through, sometimes the feed dogs force the lower layer out to one side. So if I've got my hand underneath, I can just keep hold of it, stop it from doing that. Then to the notch, balancing the cuff, and then I'll carry on stitching. So that's the body of the jacket assembled. So you can see I've got my pleats pressed out. I still need to put in the boning channels for the back and side seams. And I've still got my waistline basting in place. I've stitched the shoulder seams together. So you can see I've not caught the canvas, so I've not added any extra bulk to that seam, so they'll lay nice and flat. And you can see where I've cut away the seam allowance on the canvas all the way around. 
and I've cut that chunk out of the side of the canvas just to help it curve around the shape of my rib cage a little bit better. I apologise for my freehand camera work, it's a little bit wobbly. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, brief, not quite so brief, uh, exploration of pad stitching and the hows, we, how we do it, the why we do it. Uh, and if it was a technique that um, gave you big, big fear before, hopefully I've managed to demystify it a little bit for you. Um, and it's something that you would consider incorporating into one of your own future projects. I have to say it is a really good addition to uh, any sewist's technical arsenal. Um, so it's, it's something that's well worth taking the time to practice and to learn. I'm so grateful to the colleagues that I had at my last workplace who took the time out of their day to show me the hand techniques and the machine techniques, uh, despite the fact that I don't actually have a machine that's capable of doing um, pad stitching. Anyway, um, the thing that gives me really big fear is going to be in the next video. I've got to uh, mark out my pattern pieces on my very expensive silk, and I've got to transfer my embroidery design onto that silk and start sewing. That is going to take me quite a few weeks. It's going to be weeks of hand sewing and then a few weeks more and possibly a few weeks more after that. So the next video in this series on the 1890s walking jacket is going to be the last. My shell is going to be going onto a hanger to await the outcome of that video. But in the meantime, I will be putting together a few different projects and jumping forward probably around about 50 years in the future and hitting the 1940s. I've got some red crepe in my dress stash that is just begging to be made into a 1940s dress. I think I've got the perfect pattern for it. So uh, that will be on my blog and there will be a video for it as well, hopefully. So keep your eyes peeled on my blog to see what pattern it is I end up picking because at the moment I've got three contenders that are possibly the perfect pattern. Um, and I will probably also be doing a 1940s slack set. So that a bit like a, a long line waistcoat and a pair of trousers. Um, I've got some grey wool in this stash that is also going to be a pretty good match for that. So watch this space. In the meantime, if you liked this video and you aren't already subscribed, please do hit subscribe. The algorithm thingy likes it and you'll get a notification of when I'm next uploaded. Um, if you liked this video, please hit the thumbs up icon. If you didn't, also hit the thumbs up icon and click the bell notification to get notified when I next upload. What did I just, I just said that. You know what to do. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.